Okay, welcome everyone. We'll wait just a moment here to let everyone get into the meeting. And then I'll, I'll cover a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. All right. All right, looks like most people have joined us now. So welcome, I'm Vanessa with the Dallas Public Library. Thank you so much for um, spending your lunch hour with us, uh, learning about birds. I know I'm excited to, to learn some more. Uh, and let's see, just a few housekeeping things. You um, probably saw when you were admitted that you had to accept an agreement because this is being recorded. So if you don't want to appear on the recording, uh, you can go ahead and turn off your camera. Uh, just so you know, you will be muted for the uh, program. However, if you have questions for our presenter, Sebastian, you can put those in the chat and we'll get to those after uh, his presentation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our uh, partners in this program series, um, Judy with the uh, Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability, and she's going to introduce our speaker for today. Yes, um, it's my pleasure to be here again um, to host, help host Earth Day every day. Thank you for joining us. This is uh, such an exciting uh, program. We have um, Sebastian here with us, and I'll tell you a little bit about him in just a moment. I just want to share a couple of things um, that's been going on with Dallas and the Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability. We just came, uh, of course, uh, we just passed um, Earth Day, which was in April 22nd and we had just lots of programming and adventures around that it was a lot of fun uh, we were able to talk to many many people and we had some great programs here as well during that time um, I just want to mention that um, one of the things that our department participated in was the uh, Wildland Foundation Water Conservation Challenge uh, it's a national mayor's challenge it's a friendly challenge and um, we ended up, it looked like we were in first place. So we're waiting to hear the final results. So we hope to be able to report on that maybe in a month or so when the Wildland Foundation lets us know. And what happens is they divide all the, the cities that participate. And there's a lot of them uh, around the country that participate into you know, the large, larger cities, uh, medium sized and then small cities. And Dallas does compete in the large city category. So uh, we hope to have uh, here share more about that. I also want to mention that uh, the city of Dallas has is a finalist in the 2021 All-American City Award. And um, the other cities that are finalists are Barberton, Ohio, Bellevue, Washington, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, Dallas, of course, El Paso joins us here in Texas as a finalist, Inglewood, Colorado, Evanston, Illinois, Fitzgerald, Georgia, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Kansas City, Missouri, Livermore, Cal uh, California, Miami Lakes, Florida, Miramar, Florida, Morrisville, uh, North Carolina, Richmond, Virginia, Southfield, Michigan, Spokane, Washington, Sumter, South Carolina, and Wheat Ridge, Colorado. So um, I, in this lineup, we are uh, the largest city and we're very pleased to be competing in this. Um, the competition will actually take place in June. So we're working on um, a lot of things right now to get ready for that. So again, we hope to be able to announce some really good news on Earth Day every day later on this year. Um, with that, I wanna to talk to you about Sebastian who's here with us. We're so excited. He um, is actually a young man who's uh, looking forward to college. So his first year in college. So. He's a very young uh, expert when it comes to birds, and we do share his love of avian creatures. Sebastian denotes, devotes, uh, actually donates his time to travel around Texas virtually, teaching adults and children what birds live in our backyard, how to identify birds, what native plants attract birds, and even tips on how to start a community bird walk. He plans to share a wealth of information today and with that, I am going to hand it over to Sebastian. Thank you. Let's see if I can get it ready. Here we go. So, hello, thank you again for having me here. I'm excited to teach you all about the backyard birds of North Central Texas. And I'll also talk about a few bird migrants as well. So let's get started. So the Texas Birds Records Committee or the TPRC for short is a committee where birders will keep track of all the birds that have been 
reported throughout the state of Texas, every single individual bird species, both common and rare vagrant species. And they'll make sure they'll vote which ones will be accepted and which ones will not. So far recently, there's been a total of 655 bird species that have been accepted throughout the state of Texas. There's a total of 1,172 bird species in North America. And there's about 10,518 bird species around the whole entire world, plus more being discovered every year. Now I'll talk to you about the common backyard birds and the all year round bird residents. So these birds are non-migratory. They spend most of the year all around in your own backyard, city and state parks. And some of, you, some of them are probably familiar. Uh, we'll start here with the morning dove, which the morning dove, a lot of you probably have seen these birds in your yard before. They're a large brown bird with black spots on the wings and a very long pointed knife shaped tail. Morning doves get their name by their calls they make, which sounds like they're like sad, mournful coos, which sounds like this. Morning doves are really shy and timid birds. They don't really like to be approached and they'll let you know when you get too close to them as they will make a distinctive wing whistle sound with their wings when they get flushed, which sounds like this. Now the morning dove is not our only species of dove that you can find around our region because there's other species of doves you can find like the white winged dove, which the white winged doves are almost similar in appearance to their closely related cousins, the morning doves, except for the white winged doves, a little bit bigger and bulkier in shape than the morning doves. And white winged doves kind of tend to be a more of a darker grayish brown color. And instead of having black spots on the wings, white winged doves have these bold white wing patches on each side of their wing, which is very prominently seen in flight, which gives the bird its name, the white winged dove. They also have these very short squared shaped tails with white on the edges of the tail feathers. White winged doves make different cooing sounds than the morning doves. The white winged doves makes a call that sounds like they're saying, who cooks for you? Which sounds like this. <laughs> and when white winged doves get flushed, they make more of a muffled wing whistle than the morning doves do, which the white winged dove sounds like this. Our next bird is the Eurasian collar dove. Now, unlike the other two previous species that were just mentioned, Eurasian collar doves are actually not native here to North America. They're actually native to Europe, but they got in Europe and Asia, but they also, but they got introduced into North America many years ago. And now they spread all throughout North America. And now they're starting to become increasingly abundant as you'll find them around in your backyards as well. Eurasian collar doves, almost similar in appearance to the morning dove, except for the Eurasian collar doves, a lot larger and paler than the morning doves. And the Eurasian collar doves have that bold black collar on the nape, which gives them their name, collar dove. And the Eurasian collar doves makes a deep cooing sound that sounds like this. <laughs> Our next bird is the rock pigeon. A lot of you are probably familiar with this bird. You've probably seen them all around in parks and cities, but the rock pigeons are actually native in Europe, but they got introduced into North America many years ago. And now they spread all throughout North America and even the whole entire world even. And now you'll find these birds pretty much everywhere. And they're actually one of the world's most numerous bird species. The rock pigeons also come in a huge variety of different color morphs and forms. Usually the typical rock pigeons, as is shown here, has like a dark gray head and neck, a paler gray body, and two black wing stripes. But there are a few rock pigeons that are kind of more darker gray, blackish gray in color with more checkered patterns on the wings. There's also a few that are kind of rusty in color. And there's even a few rock pigeons that have patches of white or completely all white in color even. Rock pigeons make these very deep cooing sounds that sounds like this. And who wouldn't forget our Texas state bird, the Northern Mockingbird. 
Northern mockingbirds are common all around you. You'll see these birds in your backyards. They're about a medium sized gray and white bird with bright piercing yellow eyes, very long thin bills. And they have these very long tails, which is usually held clocked, cocked up when the bird's foraging to keep balance. And they have these bold white wing patches on their wings, which is seen very prominently when the bird's in flight. Juvenile mockingbirds are actually a little bit smaller, shorter tailed, and they do not have the piercing yellow eyes of the adults. Instead, juvenile mockingbirds have the dark brown eyes. And they also have a lot of little speckles on the chest as well. Mockingbirds, you'll see them spend most of their time, usually you'll see the males perch on an exposed tree branch way up high, trying to sing their hearts out to attract the female. The mockingbirds, unlike other birds, they don't actually make their own songs. They actually will copy songs from other birds and other sounds that they hear around them. So you might actually get to hear one mockingbird make the sound of like a blue jay or a cardinal, but then also sound like a dog barking or a baby crying or a chainsaw or even a, a car alarm even. Mockingbirds are usually seen foraging on the ground and they have a special way of catching their insects. Sometimes you might see a mockingbird fan its, out its wings like this to try to scare off any insects. And once they hit that insect with the wings, they'll take off and then and grab that insect and swallow it whole. And a lot of you are probably familiar with this bird, the Northern Cardinal, which these birds are common all around you, especially in your backyards and your cities and state parks. The male cardinals are completely all red in color with a black face, reddish orange cone shaped beak, and they have the big red crest, which can be raised or flattened at any time. Female cardinals, however, look totally different than the males. Female cardinals are completely all brown in color. They still have black in the face and a reddish orange cone shaped beak, and they have the big crest, which is raised or flattened. Juvenile cardinals do not have black in the face, and they look like the females, but with a dark grayish black bill. Cardinals have those short, thick bills, which allows them to grind up really hard seeds and nuts that are otherwise too difficult for the other smaller birds to digest. Cardinal males, you'll see them spend most of their time perched on an exposed tree branch, singing their hearts out, sometimes making calls. Sounds like they're saying that they're pretty, 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 pretty. Our next bird is the blue jay. Blue jays, a really common bird found mainly in deciduous forests, woodlands, parks, and even your own backyards, you'll see these birds. The blue jays, a large blue and white bird with a black necklace, and they have this very big crest, which can be raised or flattened at any time, like a cardinal's crest. Blue jays are actually members of the corvid family, which that's the crows, ravens, and magpies. And like their cousins, blue jays are super smart, intelligent birds. They can actually remember which trees have the best food source for them and also where they, they hid their acorns during the whole winter months. Although there are some blue jays that will let the acorns grow over time on the, under the ground and they'll eventually grow into oak trees, which really helps out the environment. Our next bird is the American crow. This bird is a huge black bird with dark eyes, very long thick bill, very long broad wings, and a short tail. Crows are usually seen in big flocks either flying around or perched roosting on trees or just foraging on the ground. Crows, as you're probably familiar with the sounds they make, make those loud calls that sounds like this. <coughs> Crows are actually like the blue jays are super intelligent birds and they can actually remember people's faces and also members of their own flocks due to the different pitch of calls they make. American crows and blue jays actually really help out the smaller birds out because most of the time when you see a lot of small songbirds on a feeder frenzy, they're unaware of what potential dangers can be lurking around them. There can be an intruding hawk nearby that, would, that can easily sneak up and get a free meal but the blue jays and the American crows always keep a lookout to make sure the hawks don't get too close. And when they spot a hawk from a distance, the blue jays and the American crows will deliver these very loud alarm calls to warn all the other birds that there's danger to flee from the feeder. 
And once they all evacuate the bird feeders, then the Blue Jays and the American Crows will actually have the audacity to dive bomb these hawks. You'll see them literally chasing after them, following them and scaring them off, sending that hawk retreating for cover. These bird, the Blue Jays and the Crows are like the bodyguards to the bird feeders. Our next bird is the Great-Tailed Crackle. This is a very common bird. You've probably seen them all around you. You've probably seen them in big flocks in your backyards. You've probably seen one fly inside HEB trying to get a free meal. Or you might even see them at the McDonald's parking lots trying to steal your french fries even. The great-tailed grackles, they kind of look like crows a little bit, but grackles are not related to crows or corvids. Grackles are actually related to the icterid blackbirds family or the American blackbirds family which there's a huge variety of species of icterid blackbirds that can be found all throughout North and South America. The male great-tailed grackle is a huge black bird with bright yellow eyes, very long thin bill, very long tails. And in, if you see them in good lights, the great-tailed grackle males have this glossy iridescence to the feathers, which can appear to be purplish blue in color. The female gray-tailed grackles are a lot smaller than the males and are shorter-tailed, and the female gray-tailed grackles are completely all dark brown in color with bright yellow eyes and long thin bill. Juvenile gray-tailed grackles kind of resemble the females where they're all brown, except for the juvenile grackles are a little bit darker blackish brown in color, and instead of having the piercing yellow eyes of the adults, juvenile gray-tailed grackles have these dark brown eyes. Great-tailed grackles formerly used to be extremely rare to the United States and can really only just be found like in Mexico, Central, and South America. But eventually, over time, great-tailed grackles finally made their way to the United States through Texas, and now they spread all throughout Texas and also now in southwestern United States. Like you can see them in California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado. And you're also starting to see them farther east to like Louisiana, and they're even making their way to Alabama. Soon, eventually, these birds will make their way to Florida even. Next bird is the red-winged blackbird. The, now, from a distance, you probably think this looks like a little baby grackle almost because he's so small. Except for you, know, when you get a better look at these birds, you'll notice red-winged blackbirds look totally different than great-tailed grackles. For one, the red-winged blackbird is literally half the size of the great-tailed grackle. And also the male red-winged blackbirds are completely all black in color with dark brown eyes, short thin bills. And not all the time do you get to see the red on the shoulders. Mainly you'll just see just the yellow stripe on the shoulders. But only when the bird is alert or trying to court to female, then you'll see the male red-winged blackbirds flare out those red shoulders and you'll see a nice red and yellow combination on the wings as they make their loud calls that sounds like this. <laughs> Female red winged blackbirds, however, look totally different than the males. Female red winged blackbirds are completely all dark brown, streaky all over, kind of resembling a large sparrow almost. Red winged blackbirds usually prefer to be in deeper woodlands, wherever there's like little creeks, swampy areas, marshlands, and also around open fields and prairies. You'll usually see the red winged blackbirds in huge flocks as they'll be on top of cattail reeds or just foraging on the ground, and usually with other blackbird species as well. Our next bird is the house sparrow. House sparrows are super common abundant birds all throughout here. I'm pretty sure if you put a bird feeder in your backyard, I'm pretty sure you almost guarantee you're gonna probably get a flock of these little birds showing up to your bird feeders. House sparrows were actually native to Europe, but they got introduced into North America many years ago. And now they spread all throughout North America and even the whole entire world even, that now you'll find house sparrows everywhere in, the, in big flocks. They're a little bit larger and bulkier than most of our other native sparrows here. And the male house sparrow has a distinctive dark chestnut brown nape, dark gray crown, black face, throat, and bib, bold white cheeks, brown back, and white belly. The female house sparrows are more of a duller, buffyish brown color. They do not have black in the face. Instead, they have like a thin brown eye line with a dull grayish crown, and they have a very dull yellowish bill. 
Our next bird is the Carolina chickadee. Carolina chickadees are super small. These little tiny hyperactive little birds, you'll see them flickering around in the trees, fluttering around. The Carolina chickadees are so small, they're only about like four or five inches long. They're tiny little guys. And the chickadees are pretty distinctive. As you'll see, the Carolina chickadees will have a black cap, bold white cheeks, black throat, grayish back, and a little bit of buffyish yellow on the flanks and the belly. They have a very long tail and they're pro proportionate to their size to help them keep balance when jumping in and out of the trees. Chickadees get their name by their calls they make, which sounds like they're saying their own name, which sounds like they're saying chickadee, d d d. Carolina chickadees are usually often seen in big flocks with other chickadees and also other small birds as well, like sparrows, warblers, and this guy, the tuft the titmouse, which the tuft the titmouse is a close relative and cousin to the chickadee. The titmouse, although, is a little bit larger in size than the chickadee. Tuft the titmouse has a real pale gray back, pale gray crest, black forehead, and a little bit of rufous on the flanks or the sides. The tufted titmouse makes a real distinctive call that sounds like they're saying, Peter, 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 Peter. And both chickadees and titmice are often seen together and you'll usually see them, you can actually see them in bird feeders and even in your own backyards, so you'll get both birds. And if you put like a small bird nest box in your backyard, you might actually get a chickadee, a titmouse or any other small bird nest in there. Our next bird is the Carolina wren. These are really common birds that are mainly found in deeper woodlands, forests, where there's little creeks. The Carolina wren's a small brown bird with a brown cap, <coughs> brown eye line, and then they have a long curved bill, and they have a little bit of buffyish on the belly and a very long tail, which is usually held cocked up when the bird's foraging to keep balance. Carolina wrens are mainly ground-dwelling birds. So they spend most of their time in the understory and in, in the thickets of the trees, usually foraging around in the leaf litter, skulking around the foliage for any hidden insects or grubs. Usually sometimes the Carolina wrens, when it gets warmer, you'll see them perch on an exposed branch like this one here. And actually, well, they'll sing their hearts out, which they make a call that so sounds like they're saying tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle, which sounds like this. Winter, 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 winter. Our next bird is the downy woodpecker. The downy woodpeckers are super common, abundant birds. Usually you'll find them around in deep woodlands and forests, wherever there's tall trees where the birds can forge. The downy woodpeckers are smallest species of woodpecker in North America, and it's actually one of our most common and widespread species of woodpeckers in North America. The downy woodpecker is real small, boldly patterned black and white, and the downy woodpeckers have a really short, thin little bill. Males and females kind of almost resemble each other almost in appearance, except for male downy woodpeckers have this small red patch of feathers on the back of their head, while the females do not have the red patch. So this bird here is a female where there's no red. Downy woodpeckers, like other woodpeckers, spend most of their time drilling beneath the tree bark trying to search for any tree boring grubs or insects that are hidden beneath the tree bark. Woodpeckers have these real special skulls and muscles around the skull that allows them to drill right through the tree's bark without getting any headaches. And they also have these real special tongues that they expand from the back of their neck on their head and they expand all the way out through their bills and they're barbed at the tip. And they allow and allows them to harpoon those insects that are deep beneath the tree surface and they're able to slurp them up. The downy woodpecker makes a very distinctive call that sounds like this. Our next bird is the red bellied woodpecker. This is another common species of woodpecker you'll find around in the eastern deciduous forests and woodlands. Usually you might see red belly woodpeckers with the downy woodpeckers. But one thing you'll notice is the red belly woodpecker is a much larger bird. This is about a medium sized woodpecker. The red belly woodpecker is tan brown, tan brown overall with a black and white striped back, very long bill. The males have an all red crown 
while the females have like a bluish gray crown with red on the forehead and one and red on the nape. So you're probably thinking, so why is this bird called a red bellied woodpecker when all the red is clearly on the head, not on the belly? Shouldn't this be called a red headed woodpecker? Well, actually, there already is such a thing as a red headed woodpecker. It's a totally different bird that lives much farther east from here, mainly in the Piney Woods region. Very elegant looking bird, but that's a totally different bird. The red belly woodpeckers, how they get their name is you don't get to see it very often, but if the bird's really close and you get to see the underneath of its belly, you might see that there's a little bit of a reddish wash on the lower belly, which gives the bird its name, but it's not very seen very often. The red belly woodpeckers make a distinctive call that sounds like this. Our next bird is the pileated woodpecker. These are really special birds here, as this is our largest living species of woodpecker in North America. And it's also our only one with a big, bold, obvious crest. Pileated woodpeckers really prefer to be around in deeper woodlands where there's taller, more mature trees. And there's usually like a little creek or running water or a little swampy area, you'll see these birds. The pileated woodpeckers, a large crow-sized woodpecker, bold black and white in color. They have these big red crests and these very long thick bills that are super strong. The male pileated woodpeckers have an all red crest with a red malar stripe below the, the bill. While the female pileated woodpeckers, they kind of have less red on the crest, more black on the forehead, and they have a black malar stripe below the bill. In flight, pileated woodpeckers have distinctive bold wing patterns where below the wings completely all white, while above the wing is completely all black with white wristbands. And they fly with this very slow, floppy, crow-like flight. And usually pileated woodpeckers are more often heard than seen, but their distinctive cries can be heard far off in a distance, literally miles away. And they make these loud calls that sounds like this. Our next bird is the Canada goose. A lot of you are probably familiar with this bird. This is a wild native species of goose here in North America. And this large brown goose has a black head and black neck and bold white cheek patch. Although a lot of you are thinking, a lot of Canada geese are migratory. They will migrate all the way up north to breed and nest, of course, in Canada during the summer and then come back down to the south for the winter. But there's also a lot of Canada geese that are starting to become really non-migratory and they're starting to adapt and live pretty well in just anywhere. And now they're starting to become common year-round residents in most places in North America and Texas. But they are still wild birds. So you don't wanna to get too close to them. You wanna give these birds their space. The Canada goose makes a distinctive honking sound that sounds like this. Our next bird is the Egyptian goose. This exotic goose is native to Africa, but got introduced into North America and many places of the world. And now they're starting to expand more in numbers. You can find them around in your cities, lakes, and parks where there's ponds. They're a medium-sized brown goose with a pale whitish head, bright yellow eyes with brown surrounding the eye. And they have these short stubby pink bills and these bright pink legs and feet. The Egyptian goose, despite it being called a goose, Egyptian geese are actually more closely related to shell ducks than actual true geese due to the bird's smaller size, the short stubby neck and bill, and also the pattern of the bird kind of resembles that of the shell duck, and also of course by their DNA. Next bird is the pie-billed grebe. These are common birds you'll find around in wetlands and ponds and marshes, wherever huge bodies of water, you'll see these birds. And you'll see them sitting up in the water like a duck almost. But actually, pipebill grebes are not ducks. Grebes are actually members of their own family. And what makes grebes different from ducks is that usually ducks have those big webbed feet, while grebes actually have these really big lobed toes. They're very weird looking, but it helps the bird keep balance when it ever does forage on land. But you don't see that very often because most chances are you see the birds always on 
underwater so you don't get to see its legs. The pie bill grieves a small brown bird with a short stubby white bill. And during the breeding plumage, the pie bill grieves will get a black ring around the bill, which gives the bird its name. And they also have a lot of black in the face and the throat. The winter plumage birds do not have black rings around their bill. Instead, it's a dull buffyish color and they have no black in the face or the throat. Pie bill grebes are usually seen diving in and out of water, trying to catch little crustaceans or fishes before surfacing back up for air. Our next bird is the American coot. Now this is another bird you'll commonly see around in wetlands, ponds, lakes, marshes. They'll be sitting floating around the water like a duck, but coots are not ducks or grebes. Coots are actually members of the Rells family, which Rells are a group of secretive marshland birds that spend most of their time hidden beneath in the reeds and the cattails and are usually far more often heard than seen. But when, if you do get to see a Rell, you'll notice they're these kind of like bizarre but cool looking chicken-like birds as they'll forge around in the lily pads. But those are totally different birds. American coots are like the total opposite. They actually, coots will actually be seen out in the open. And sometimes they are pretty much more often seen than heard only. American coots are really dark birds. They're completely all black in color, even though there's more black on the head and the neck, the body's more of a slate gray color. American coots have these bright piercing red eyes, bold white bills, bold white facial shields above the bill. And some breeding birds will actually get a red knob on the top of the white facial shield. And American coots have these real long greenish yellow legs and feet. And they have these really big weird lobed toes as well. These big lobed feet allows the coot to stand and forge onto rocks submerged on their water without them slipping and sliding. And also those big feet allows them to act as rudders. So when the bird's swimming, it can swim faster. And also when it's taking off in flight from the water, they get a nice running start. Our next bird is the snowy egret. Snowy egrets are wading birds that are usually commonly found around in creeks, marshes, wetlands, usually around the shoreline. You'll see them walking around in the shallow water trying to patiently hunt fish. The snowy egrets, a medium-sized white egret with bright golden yellow lores or the bare facial skin around the bird's eyes. And they also have those long black bills, black legs, and these bright golden yellow slippers, golden yellow feet or golden slippers as birders will call them, which helps, helps you tell them apart from their much larger cousins, the great egret. Which from a distance, the great egret can resemble a snowy egret almost, but except for the great egrets literally twice the size of the snowy egret. And the great egrets have a bright yellow bill as well as yellow facial lores, while snowy egrets have the black bill. But that feature can be kind of misleading because there are a few great egrets that do have like a dull grayish black bill with yellow lores. But other than size, the other most reliable feature for, to tell great egrets apart from snowy egrets is that snowy egrets have those bright golden yellow slippers while great egrets do not. The great egrets legs and feet are completely all black. And great egrets are usually far more often seen than the snowy egrets are. Our next bird is the great blue heron. These tall dark wading birds can be commonly found around in wetlands, ponds, lakes, marshes, usually sitting around in the shore. And when you see these birds, they're super tall birds and they're patient hunters. They're, they'll literally stand perfectly still around the water's surface, literally not even moving a muscle, not even blinking their eyeballs, nothing. Just standing perfectly still till a fish swims their way. Then they'll dart their long bills right into the wall, water, grab the fish and swallow it whole. Great blue herons have a very graceful flight. They fly with these very long, slow wing beats, and they fly with their legs stretched out and their necks tucked in. Our next bird is the double crested cormorant. These are common water birds you'll see around in the shores. They're a large black water bird with bright orange facial skin and a long bill which is hooked at the tip. 
the juveniles and non-breeding birds kind of have a duller grayish brown head and neck. Double crested cormorants have a very distinctive flight. They fly with these weird, bizarre, quick wing beats. They kind of fly almost like kind of goose-like a little bit, but with more of a clumsier flight. And they fly in these real loose, scattered U or V flock formations. Double crested cormorants, when you see them floating on the water surface, sometimes you'll just see just the head and the neck of the bird sticking out of the water, which can kind of almost look like a snake from a distance. Cormorants, you'll usually see them spend most of their time perched on an exposed snag or rock close to the water surface, because unlike most of our other water birds, cormorants do not have waterproof feathers. So cormorants have to literally stand out in the open and let the sun rays hit those wings and their feathers to dry up. Our next bird is the osprey. Ospreys are really common raptors to be found around in lakes, ponds, and wetlands where there's bodies of water. For these birds, their diet really relies on fish, rarely anything else. The ospreys, you'll see them hovering around in the water surface, and when they see a fish, they'll plunge dive right into the water, with, extend their talons, and grab the fish from underwater and take off with it. And they have these very special scales around their feet and talons, which allows them to get a better grip of the fish without it slipping and sliding out of their talons. The osprey is a large white raptor with a dark mask, bright yellow eyes, a lot of speckles on the, the feathers on the chest, which kind of resembles a necklace. And they have these very long, slightly dehedral or crooked wing shape, which makes gives them a distinctive silhouette. Our next bird is the red-tailed hawk. These are really common widespread birds. This is our most common and widespread bootio all throughout North America, which bootios are the typical hawks, which include the red tail hawks. Red tail hawks come in a variety of different forms and colors and morphs, but usually most of our birds have a brown head, brown back, white belly, and that rich rufous red tail, which gives the bird its name. Red tail hawks will usually be seen around in all kinds of habitats, even in your own backyards. They'll spend most of their time usually circling around the air, gliding, trying to see if they can find any prey. They'll catch a variety of small mammals, small birds, and snakes. Red-tailed hawks make that loud piercing cry that you'll hear on TV, which sounds like this. Our next bird is the red-shouldered hawk. Red-shouldered hawks are another common booty owl found around here, but they usually prefer to be around in deeper woodlands and forests, wherever there's like a little creek or running, running water or a little swampy area, you'll see these birds. The red-shouldered hawk's a lot smaller than the red-tailed hawk. Red-shouldered hawks are about a medium-sized hawk. They have a rich rufous red head and belly and body, and they have these rich red shoulders that gives them their name and they have these black and white bands on the wings and black and white band tail. Red-shouldered hawks will eat the same prey diet as red-tailed hawks will, which includes small mammals, small birds, and snakes, but also red-shouldered hawks will also incorporate a lot of aquatic diet to their, <laughs> aquatic prey to their diet, which they can catch crustaceans, fish, and frogs. Red-shouldered hawks make a call that sounds like this. <laughs> Our next bird is the great horned owl. This is our most common and widespread owl all throughout North America. You'll find them in huge variety of habitats from the freezing Arctic tundra to the scorching hot deserts, from the deep forested woodlands to even to the comfort of your own backyard, you'll find these owls around all around you. The great horned owl is a large brown owl with bright piercing yellow eyes and those big ear tufts which gives the birds its name. Actually, but those ear tufts are actually not the bird's real ears. They're just tufts or extra feathers to allow the bird to kind of channel in sound a little bit better and also to get, make, give the bird a more bigger, intimidating look. Great horned owl's real ears are actually, like other owls, are hidden behind the head feathers, which are behind the facial disc, which you can't see them, but owls have these very asymmetrical ears, which that means 
one ear is way up higher in position than the other. And they use these oddly proportioned ears to allow them to pinpoint exactly where the prey's located with a vertical location. And the great horn owls will catch a variety of prey, usually from the, up to their size, maybe even bigger. And they will actually eat skunks. And you're probably thinking, so how's the owl able to eat a skunk when the skunk's spray so, smells so toxic? Well, actually, the great horn owls have no sense of smell. So if the skunk tries to spray at the owl, the owl's immune to the spray of the skunk. So now the only defense left from the skunk is just run away. The great horn owls makes that deep hooting call that you hear that sounds like this. Our next bird is the Eastern Screech Owl. These are small, tiny owls that can be common around in forces, woodlands, and your own backyards. They're about eight inches, they're super tiny, they're small gray owl with bright yellow eyes, yellow bills, and those small little ear tufts. Most screech owls are usually gray in color, but there are a few color morphs that, of screech owls that can be brown or even red in color. The eastern screech owls usually will catch smaller prey, but sometimes it can catch birds of the size of cardinals and even blue jays. The eastern screech owls make the distinctive trilling sound that sounds like this. Our next bird is the barred owl. And the barred owl is another common owl that you can find around you, but these owls usually prefer to be in, prefer deeper woodlands and forces, wherever there's like a little creek or running water, a little bit of a swampy area even. The barred owl is a large owl, and a couple things you'll notice them about this owl that makes them different from the other two is that barred owls do not have ear tufts, and also, Instead of having the piercing yellow eyes of like the great horn owls and the screech owls, barred owls have these really dark brown eyes. They also have bright yellow beaks and they have these vertical brown streaks or bars around the belly and the back, which gives the bird its name, barred owl. And they make these deep hooting calls. It sounds like they're saying, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Similar to that of the white winged dove, but with different syllables and deeper sounding, which sounds like this. Our next bird is the barn owl, which barn owls are usually found around in prairies, open fields, agricultural areas, as well as forces as well. The barn owl is a medium-sized owl, has a golden tawny brown back, super pale white belly, white heart-shaped face, brown eyes with no ear tufts. Barn owls, as the name suggests, they do live nest in old barns and sheds, but they'll also nest as well in tree hollows as well. Barn owls spend most of their time hovering over open fields, fly, flapping their wings with an erratic butterfly-like flight as they're trying to search for rodents. And barn owls make these really loud shrieking sounds that sounds very un like that sounds like this. Our next bird is the turkey vulture. Turkey vultures are a very common widespread raptor all throughout North America. You'll probably see them flying around all over the place in huge flocks or kettles, usually circling around in the air looking for any dead carrion. Turkey vultures are like about a large blackish brown raptor with a bare red head, bare red legs and feet. And in flight, they have a dehedral wing shape they have very long wings with pointed V, v pointed wings, and they have dark black and gray pattern wings. And they also have these very long gray tails. Turkey vultures, like other vultures, are scavengers. So they actually don't hunt live prey due to their weak talons and feet. So instead, they'll actually eat prey that's already dead, like carrion and roadkills. So if you see like a dead deer or possum or raccoon, you can see a bunch of vultures lining up trying to eat all those dead carrion. And the turkey vulture has a real special sense of smell that it can actually smell a rotting carcass from literally two football fields away. 
Along with turkey vultures, you will also see their smaller cousins, the black vultures, usually associating with them. Black vultures are kind of almost similar in appearance to the turkey vultures, except for the black vultures, a little bit smaller, more of a solid black color, and they have like a duller bare gray head with chalk white legs and feet. In flight, they have a shorter wingspan with more U-pointed wings, and they have black wings with bold white fingertips, and they have these real short black tails, which helps you tell them apart from the turkey vultures. Well, now we'll get to the spring and summer bird migrants. So these birds are neotropical bird migrants. So they spend the winter months down in Mexico, Central and South America. And then during the springtime, they'll pass through to the Southern United States like Texas as they're migrating up North to go proceed to the Northern United States and Canada and Alaska to breed and nest there during the summer. Before coming back down South for the fall, in Texas before coming back to their wintering grounds. But there are a few of these <laughs> neotropical migrants that will actually spend the whole summer here with us in Texas, like the painted bunting, which painted buntings arrive around early April and leave around mid-September, with a few lingering around till late September, early October. Painted buntings are very beautiful birds. You can find these colorful birds all around you in your city and state parks. And even if you're lucky enough, you might even get one of these colorful birds show up to your bird feeders in your own backyards even. Male painted buntings are completely distinctive. As you'll see, they have the blue head, the green back, and the bright red belly. Females are more of a bright lime green color. And the young males kind of almost resemble females in appearance except for the difference is that only male painted buntings will sing, not females. So if you see what looks like a female painted bunting singing, that is not a female, that's a young male. He's just trying out his voice. Painted buntings are actually members of the Cardinals and Grosbeak family. So they're closely related to our familiar Northern Cardinals. Our next bird is the black chin hummingbird. They arrive around late March to early April and they leave around October the black chin hummingbirds are super quick, agile little birds. They're super fast. They're kind of tough to see with binoculars as they zoom right past you so quickly. Unless, of course, the bird is resting on a perch or on a hummingbird feeder. Then you can get better details of the bird. The black chin hummingbird males are glossy green color with a black and purple throat or gorget. Usually it appears all black from a distance, but if you see the bird in good light, you get to you might get to see the purplish underneath as well. Female black chin hummingbirds are a little bit duller than the males, and they do not have the black and purple gorget. Instead, they just have a white throat. And black chin hummingbirds have very long, slightly curved bills at the tip. Our next bird is the ruby-throated hummingbirds. They arrive around late March to early April and they leave around mid to late October with a few lingering around till November. Ruby-throated hummingbird males are bright emerald green color with a bright ruby red throat and gorget. Female ruby-throated hummingbirds look super similar to female black chin hummingbirds and can be often mistaken for each other. Except for if you get a better look, you'll notice the female ruby-throated hummingbirds have more of a brighter emerald green color than the female black chin hummingbirds. Also, ruby-throated hummingbirds have more of a shorter, straighter bill than the black chin hummingbirds. Our next bird is the barn swallow. They arrive around late February to early March, and they leave around mid-November, with a few lingering around till early December. Barn swallows are very graceful aerial acrobatics. You'll see them hovering around in open fields, pastures, meadows, around lakes, trying to drink water and catch insects by the wing. Barn swallows are about a medium sized bird. They have a blue back, blue cap, red throat, and a buffyish yellow belly. In flight, they have these very long pointed wings and these very long forked tails. Barn swallows are super chatterative birds. They make these real high pitched calls that sounds like this. Barn swallows, as the name suggests, will nest in old barns, but they'll also make their gourd shaped nests in out of clay, dirt, mud, and sticks around in your own backyards 
in your porches, and even on bridges. And we do have a pair of barn swallows in, our, in my yard that actually will make a nest annually every summer in our front porch, which is pretty cool. Our next bird is the purple martin. They arrive around mid to late February and they leave around mid-September. They're rare around October and November. Purple martins are swallows. They're much bigger and larger than the barn swallow. And the males have a dark glossy purplish black color while the females are more of a dull grayish color. Purple martins are usually seen in big, loud, noisy flocks. Usually if during the fall migration, you'll actually get to witness a big roosting parties of purple martins as they're going back down south from Mexico, Central and South America during the winter. Purple martins make these chatterative calls, sounds like this. <laughs> Back in the old days, the Native American Indians will actually make these gourd-shaped nests out of squashes to try to attract these birds to their land because the purple martins will actually eat up all the mosquitoes and gnats so it'll destroy their crops and also dive bomb and scare off the vultures that are trying to eat their dead prey. So the Native American Indians rewarded these birds and allowed them to stay around in their land and territories. And now eventually that's been a trait that these birds picked up for ever since centuries later. And now you'll see them in these gourd shaped nests. Our next bird is the scissor tail flycatcher. They arrive around mid to late March and they leave around late <laughs> November, late October, mid November with a few and they're rare around December to January. Scissor tail flycatchers are really graceful birds. They're super pale white with darker wings and very long streamer shaped tails, which is split, which kind of resembles scissors. Males have bright salmon pink on the underbelly and very long tails. The females and younger birds, however, have less pink on the belly and shorter tails. Scissor tail flycatchers, you'll usually see them hovering around in open fields and meadows trying to catch any insects by the wing as they'll be hovering very gracefully. Our next bird is the summer tanager. They arrive around early to mid April and they leave around late September to early October. Summer tanagers are really cool, colorful neotropical birds that you can find around in deeper woodlands and forests where there's little creeks. The male summer tanager is completely all red in color, which you're probably thinking, doesn't this kind of look like a male cardinal because they're all red? Except for male cardinals have that big crest, the black face, and the reddish orange cone-shaped beak, while summer tanagers do not have a crest or black in the face and instead have a much longer dinner bill and it's more of a yellowish color. Plus, summer tanagers have more of a different shade of red to them than the male cardinals. Female summer tanagers are completely all yellow in color, and both males and female summer tanagers will make an alarm call, which is pretty distinctive, that sounds like this. Our next bird is the yellow warbler. These are the kind of birds that will actually pass through the state during the springtime around mid-April and leave around late May as they're advancing to go up north to the northern United States, Canada, and Alaska to breed and nest there for the summer before coming back down south for the fall around mid-August and they'll leave around late September, early October as they're going back to their wintering grounds in Mexico, Central, and South America. As the name suggests, the yellow warbler is a bright all yellow warbler. The males are a little bit brighter yellow than the females and male yellow warblers have those red streaks on the belly, while, which the females don't have. And the yellow warblers make a call that sounds like they're saying, sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. Our next bird is the black and white warbler. They arrive around mid-March, mid-May, and they leave around about late September, early October, and they're rare around November to February. Black and white warblers, as in the name suggests, is a boldly patterned black and white warbler. Although males have a black mask and a black throat, females and younger birds have a white throat and no black mask. The black and white warblers will usually spend most of their time creeping up the tree bark, kind of acting like a little woodpecker nuthatch-like almost, as they're trying to scrape the bark for any insects. 
black and white warblers make these really high pitched calls. Sounds like they're saying squeaky, 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 squeaky. Our next bird is the common nighthawk. They arrive around late April to early May and they leave around late September, early October. These are really cool, spectacular birds to find in your own backyards. They're about a medium sized grayish brown bird. Males have a bold white throat. Females have a buffyish brown throat. And in flight, common night hawks have these very long pointed wings with these bold white wing patches on each side of their wing. They fly with this real quick erratic bat-like flight as they're hovering over open fields, trying to catch any insects by the wing. And common night hawks make these very loud calls that sounds like this. Beep, 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 beep. Boom. Now, despite being called night hawks, night hawks are actually not related to true hawks. Night hawks are actually related to the night jars family, which night jars are a group of secretive nocturnal birds that spend most of the time during the daytime well hidden in the, the forest and the thickets, very rarely seen. And then when it gets dark, however, the night jars will wake up and make these really loud calls which most of these are far more often heard than seen due to their nocturnal habits. Our next bird is the green heron. They arrive around early April and they leave around mid to late October with a few lingering around till November. They're a small chunky dark green and brown heron with a long pointed bill and they have bright orange yellow, yellow legs and feet. Green herons are really intelligent birds on the way they fish because they'll actually Cat and put like a piece of bread or a feather above the water to act as bait. So then the little minnows can swim up and try to catch that, that bait. And when the little minnow gets too close, the green heron will snap that bill and swallow the minnow whole. Our next bird is the yellow crowned night heron. They arrive around mid to late March and they leave around early to mid October. A medium sized gray heron with a black head, bold white cheeks, red eyes, and a golden yellow crest held above the head. Juvenile yellow crown night herons look totally different than the adults. Juvenile night herons are completely all dark grayish brown all over and they're heavily spotted and speckled and streaked all over. Well, now we'll get to the fall and winter bird migrants, which these birds will spend most of their time usually in the Southern United States for the winter like Texas before migrating up north to like the northern United States, Canada, and even Alaska to breed and nest there for the summer before coming back down south for the fall. Example of birds like these are the ring-billed gulls. The ring-billed gulls arrive around late August to early September, and they leave around mid to late May. With a few, the most prominent way you'll see these birds seasons around November to March. Ring-billed gulls, now you're probably thinking, so aren't seagulls usually found around in open oceans and coasts? True, but there are also several species of seagulls or gulls that can be found all throughout freshwater ponds and lakes all around you, like the ring-billed gulls. Ring-billed gulls are a medium-sized gull. They vary in plumage over the years, but the most obvious feature that you can tell them apart is they have those bold black rings around the bill, which gives them their name, ring-billed gulls. Our next bird is the American white pelican. Despite that there can be occasionally year-round residents, they're really highly migratory. And they only are mainly found in the winter months, usually from like October through April. And they're rare during the summer. The American white pelicans, this is another bird you think is can be only found in coast and open oceans. But American white pelicans do just as well as in freshwater ponds and lakes as well. The American white pelican is a huge white bird with a big orange pouch shaped bill, very long black and white wingspan with a short tail. And then you'll see them either soaring overhead or just floating in the water, looking like a giant overgrown duck. Unlike their marine cousins, the brown pelicans, American white pelicans don't plunge dive the water for fish. Instead, they'll sit in the water, they'll skim their long bills through the water surface and to see if they feel a fish. Once they feel it, they'll snap open those big beaks and swallow the fish whole. Our next bird is the cedar waxwing. They arrive around early November and they leave around mid to late May. 
Cedar waxwings were often seen in big flocks, usually on top of trees in huge numbers. The cedar waxwings are a medium-sized brown bird with a black mask, slick brown crest, bright yellow belly, grayish wings and tail, and they have these little red spots on the wings and yellow tip tail. Cedar waxwings really love to eat berries, so you'll see them eating all kinds of berries like holly berries, beauty berries, all kinds of berries. Now our final bird will be the yellow-bellied sapsucker. They arrive around mid-October and they leave around April. The yellow-bellied sapsucker is actually a, a common woodpecker species that is usually found during the winter months here. They're a medium-sized woodpecker, bigger than the downy but smaller than the red belly. And unlike the other woodpeckers, sapsuckers are pretty quiet birds. They don't really vocalize as much. And the yellow-bellied sapsuckers are a bold black and white color. Males have a red crown and red throat with a bright yellow belly. Females have a white throat with less yellow on the belly. And the younger birds and juveniles are dull brownish in color. Sapsuckers get their name by that they really depend drilling on sap trees to slurp up sap from the trees. So now here are ways you can help birds. You can plant native plants and trees around your backyard, city, and state parks. Put up a bird feeder or bird bath. Just make sure to clean the bird feeders and bird baths daily and regularly. Lights out for birds during peak migration, which is around 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. Spring peak migration starts around April 1st and ends around May 31st. Fall peak migration starts around August 15th and ends around November 15th. Don't use pesticides. Use natural organic pest control products or nature's pest control products like ladybugs. The cute little ladybugs actually will eat up all those little tiny aphids that are destroying the grasses and the plants. And then don't release balloons into the sky. It's harmful and fatal to all wildlife. And of course, learn about the birds in your area. Now here are a few Texas native plants for birds. So here are the understory plants. So you can plant like American beauty berries, evergreen summocks, Texas persimmons, agaritas. These kind of plants will attract all kinds of birds like mockingbirds, cardinals, warblers, sparrows. And then to escape cover and places to raise young, you can put plant like Texas mountain laurels, cherry laurels, Texas sage to attract all kinds of ground dwelling birds like the Carolina wrens, mockingbirds, and sparrows, and then native grasses. You can plant a bunch of native grasses in your yard, just leave the seed heads on through the winter. And a lot of ground dwelling birds like sparrows, doves, and even bobwhite quail really like to be around in tall grass where they can hide and take cover in there. Then you can also plant native berries like American beauty berries, coral berries, pigeon berries, native lantanas which can attract all kinds of birds like cardinals, cedar waxwings, and warblers. And nectar producing plants like red buckeyes, Mexican buckeyes, Turks cap, can attract all kinds of hummingbirds in your own backyards. Well, here are a few Dallas area birding resources and links provided below here on the screen. If you're interested in joining a bird walk around your community, or if you're interested in starting a bird walk for your, for your community as well. Here are also some hot spots, that cool birding hot spots that are close around in the Dallas area, like the White Rock Lake, which, has a, which is a big lake. You can really practice your waterfowl ID skills. And there's also a little forested area where you can also see all the forest woodland birds and songbirds as well. I can actually, I'll actually send an email to Ms. Schmidt and she, so she can send them all out to all of you. Well, thank you again for coming to my presentation. I hope you love, enjoyed the presentation and learned a lot about these backyard birds. Let's go out there and go explore all the birds around us. Thank you so much, Sebastian. That was a, oh, so, so very informative. I know I learned, um, a bunch, especially connecting, uh, I think there's a lot of comments in the chat about how wonderful your bird calls were, because it's helped me connect a lot of the birds to the bird calls yes. that I hear. <laughs> That's very helpful. 
Um, do you have a time for a couple of questions that we had in the chat? Yes, we have time for a few questions. Okay. Um, how did you get into birding and what are your future career plans? Oh, how I, I got started into birding was because when I was like seven years old, I went to the bookstore and I came across this huge bird book. It was an Audubon bird book. And I was like excited about this book because I was like, amazed by all the beautiful pictures of the birds. I'm like, wow, all these birds existed here. And like, I, so I wanted to buy this book. So once we bought it, I studied the whole book. And now I'm like, wow, I need to get everybody interested in birds too. So they can be aware of these beautiful birds around them. That's awesome. Um, and let's see what other questions we had. Um, what is your favorite bird? Do you have a favorite bird? I know it's quite hard to pick, but. <laughs> oh, it's the blue jays. Always grown up looking at blue jays and I always love those blue jays. They're because blue is my favorite color. So the blue jays have like a really nice blue color and they're really loud and, and cool birds at the same time. Yeah, you know, Sebastian, you were talking about how the crows can recognize faces, but yes. I wonder about the blue jays too, because um, they sit and wait for me to come out in the morning because I give them the peanuts in the shell. And I have a special little swing feeder that's not enclosed or anything. It's in like an open porch swing with a, um, a grate in the bottom. And so the, the peanuts don't fall through. But when they see me come out, there's usually one almost as a sentinel and starts calling. And also sometimes I feed the birds and take care of the cats for my neighbor when they're out of town, uh, just like a block away. And it's so funny. I promise you, they will follow me. It's like they follow the car. I mean, wow. I really do feel like they know who I am and they know the car because suddenly they'll all be there waiting for me to put the peanuts in the feeder down there too. So anyway, they're incredible yeah. birds. I love them it. too. Uh, um, so is, is bird watching, as someone asked, is bird watching was a family activity? Is the rest of your family into birding as well? Yes, I've finally got my parents interested in birds and we enjoy going trips, the three of us looking at birds. Oh, that's, oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, someone had a question about hummingbird feeders. Um, they have a hummingbird feeder, but they never see anything on it. Do you know like what the best placement for having any advice on placing hummingbird feeders? Mm. Well, usually it depends. Like hummingbirds usually like to be around where there's little thickets, like bushes where they can just land to hide cover. And they also where there's a lot of flowers as well. So if you kind of have like a little garden and then you put your hummingbird feeder there, and if you use like the clear nectar dye, it's a little bit healthier for the hummingbirds. Then that's probably how you might get more hummingbirds to your yard. Also, of course, during the spring and summer is when the hummingbirds are active. You'll see them more often. Yeah. I also heard that you really need to go on and put your feeder out at the beginning of February, even though the weather may not seem conducive because the scouts, the the males start coming in early. They come in earlier than the females uh, yes. from the migra migration over the Gulf. And yes. that's, I don't know if that's true or not. Do you find that? that is, that's true because most of the time, like whenever, like I would see a summer tanager or painted bunting back here in Austin, it would always usually be a male first as he's scouting the area in the early spring. And then soon eventually the females and the younger birds will arrive after the males. And it's kind of the same true backwards when the birds are leaving down south for the fall. The males are always the first ones to leave and last ones that stick around are usually the females or younger birds. I see. Ah, oh, interesting. Oh, good, good. Yeah, I think there's a lot of good um, conversation in the chat going on too about everyone spotting different birds. So that's... <laughs> Yes. I think I think everyone has some new birds to look out for too. I know uh, there's a couple that I, you know, probably have seen but never really thought about. So now I'm gonna have to keep my eyes open and see if I can spot those. <laughs> yeah, it's really wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And I just I cannot believe how talented you are with the the bird calls. Yeah. That's just keep that up. That is super and just. And they do. I mean, I saw someone put in the chat that their dog was barking when you did one of the calls. So I think, you know, they're very true to life. They're very true to nature. So congratulations on that and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. All right. Thank you all so much, everyone. Um, uh, please join us next week uh, when we're talking more about exploring the 
uh, outdoors in Texas. So this is a great time of year to think about that. So you can register for that. Um, I'll put a link in the chat real quick here. Um, and when you're out exploring the outdoors, be sure, like Sebastian said, look at look out for the birds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> be their friend. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you. Y'all have a great day. Bye. Everyone at the library. Bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye.